I mean, the, the, these uh, gene technology acts around the world were put in place for very good reasons mm. in that genetically modified organisms can mm. represent an ex existential threat, a, a threat to the existence of, of humanity because the, the, the potential to uh, engineer a genetically modified organism which has got a very, very high infection fatality rate, very, very high transmissible uh, transmissibility that, that that risk is there so it's it's what, what came to my mind when you were talking there Julian is if I went to a shop and asked for a bag of apples mm -hmm. and the shopkeeper said certainly here's a bag of apples he gave me a bag and I got home and I found there were oranges mm -hmm. well I would be inconvenienced I'd have to go back and say no just a minute you know you've given me oranges on it but we're not talking about that we are talking about governments around the world and regulators around the world that said hey John here's a vaccine and because I've given vaccines all my life and received vaccines all my life I said oh vaccines oh jolly good mm -hmm. but they weren't vaccines they were genetically modified organisms and yeah. not only that they said they would stay local the systemically distributed they said they would only transfect in the arm they transfect systemically mm. you know basically i'm um, i'm furious and i think a lot of people are angry about this misrepresentation much more serious than confusing apples and oranges and um what what you've told me there any biological entity tick i get that one capable of transferring genetic material the transfection is obvious or it wouldn't work tick and uh, recombinant technology, th th these, these are new organisations of the adenine, guanine, cytosine and uracil, the basis of the ribonucleic acid. Um, I, I just find it totally con convincing. And um, I'm, I'm just really quite, well, yeah, v v very angry that we've been, it's been misrepresented in this way. W w the other question that springs to my mind is that a lot of... Um, manufacturers around the world certainly in the uk mm. pfizer moderna were given indemnity mm. inexplicably <laughs> by yes. our politicians um some people might have some ideas why our politicians exempted them from uh, indemnity uh, but we don't know um i certainly don't know um would the fact that these are genetically modified organisms and not vaccines as claimed invalidate that indemnity that manufacturers were awarded by our um yes government that's it's, it's an interesting um legal argument for sure and so to be clear we've currently got the civil proceedings against Pfizer and Moderna in the federal court and what we're seeking there is to show the federal court that a that they are GMOs and that b both manufacturers knew that they were GMOs and therefore should have applied for uh, GMO licenses. Now, when we do that, those two boxes to tick off then show the court, well, that means both companies are committing a serious criminal offence. Once that's understood by the court and recognised, well, then the court should issue us an injunction preventing any further supply of those products. But let's just take it back a few steps there. We have to show the federal court in a civil context that therefore these companies are committing a serious criminal offence by not having the GMO licences. The court's not going to penalise those companies in any criminal respect. They're just going to issue us, hopefully, an injunction to stop them because we don't want the supply anymore to the next unknowing family or the mother with their child who's not been informed about this. Now, the criminal aspect, that requires the prosecuting authorities. And so we've taken this material to our Commonwealth Director of Public Prosecutions and set it all out uh, in a criminal brief of evidence for that authority, uh, simply saying, well, we've, we've got the evidence here. We've, it, satis pardon me, it satisfies the legal definitions, but moreover, um, this isn't really a contest anymore because Dr. Raj Bueller, before a Senate Estimates Committee last year, uh, admitted that they are GMOs. So with that admission that they are GMOs and the manufacturers not having the GMO licenses, 
we've got serious criminal offences, please prosecute. Um, <laughs> so that's all been laid out, and we first approached the Attorney General, who wouldn't return our calls or reply to our correspondence, just went silent. Okay. Uh, this so is the, the Attorney General wasn't concerned that Australian laws might have been broken by the sound uh, of that? Well, the Attorney General stay, has stayed silent. Just silent. So there's, we can't say exactly, but we know that we've given the very intelligent uh, Mark Dreyfus all of this information. He's, a, he's of King's Council, used to be called Queen's Council until the passing of, of Elizabeth. Um, and so he's a very, very intelligent law officer. And we dare say, and I'm allowed to <laughs> take a stab in the dark, that he hasn't responded because the information is correct. Now, the very first thing that you would do seeking to stop any undue alarm in the, community, in the community, if we were wrong, the Attorney General should have turned around and bopped us on the head and said, look, mate, your information's incorrect. They're not GMOs for these reasons. And don't go out into the community and scaring people. Right? That's what you do as a responsible law officer if our information was incorrect. But instead, we have Attorney General Mark Dreyfus staying silent. Because this, this is a huge political liability football that we're talking about, the, the hottest potato globally that I've ever seen in my life or, or known of in history. So then we elevate it to the Commonwealth Director of Public Prosecutions, who's meant to be political, apolitical, who's not to be concerned about potential government liability. And instead, the response that we got from the Commonwealth Director of Public Prosecutions after showing the director that the gene technology regulator has admitted their GMOs. I mean, what more do you need, Director? Instead, sent the brief back to us. Didn't say our information was incorrect. Instead said, it's not properly formatted for the purposes of submitting as evidence in a court. That was bluster for saying, we've got this thing called the Evidence Act. You've got the same thing in your country. Your evidence has not been structured or packaged correctly in the appropriate you know, manner for presenting in court. Now, that gets sent back, but <clears throat> here's, the, here's where you start getting a little bit angry with the director. He doesn't point out which part of our evidence hasn't, has not been packaged correctly. In other words, he has to leave it up to us to work out what he wants to, you know, what the form that he wants to, to receive it in before he'll take it to court. So this is a director of public prosecution who is trying to waste time at this point. Well, they're clearly in the back room doing damage control because they know that our team is, A, in the Federal Court of Australia presenting evidence, and so they can't be seen to interfere with that because that would be obstructing the course of justice and everyone would lose their jobs um, and go to prison if they try and interfere with that. But they also know that we've been out in the public, substack articles and communicating with other groups globally, like lawyers in South Africa, uh, contacting UK MPs, like uh, Andrew Bridgen MP has received a, a, a legal advice for the UK situation, showing how your MHRA was aware all the time that these things were GMOs, but chose not to inform the UK citizenry, your population was not told, even though the MHRA was aware. We provided similar information to what's called MEPs, members of the European Parliament in the European Union, <clears throat> to show them how the European laws very, very clearly captured these drugs, but when they were being processed by the EMA, the European Medicines Agency, similar to your MHRA, inexplicably, the section that needed to be filled out on GMOs is just blank. Just blank, John. No explanation. Moderna, I think, put put an NA there, not, not applicable. It's like, well, on what basis is it not applicable? It was entirely applicable. But here's the, here's the issue. Here's the issue. And we saw it with the example of AstraZeneca. AstraZeneca, it's the same for the UK and the same for the, the European Union. Before you, Pfizer Moderna could go properly to the MHRA 
<clears throat> so I'll put the UK to one side. We'll just look at Australia and the, and the EU. Before they could properly receive approvals in, in both the EU, millions of people, what is it, 340 million people thereabouts, 26 million people in Australia, before they could go TGA in Australia and get approval, getting a GMO license requires both manufacturers to provide extensive what's called dossiers with a risk profiling of what are the gen genetic and environmental, but really risks to humans from introducing this new form of genetically modified organism. And then, you, so that's, that dossier has got to be received by a group like the OGTR in this country and si a similar s subcommittee to the European Medicines Agency that deals with GMOs in products there. And that requires months of evaluation. And here's the critical part. In both jurisdictions, the OGTR and the EMA are required to announce it, advertise it to the public, and say, we are doing a risk assessment before approval of this genetically modified drug. We are receiving public submissions. Now, those public submissions generally come from, well, Joe Blow, the guy on the street, who's just got some basic knowledge, but generally a lot of PhDs pile in. If you are independent of government, who know the subject matter, and like we saw with AstraZeneca, I read the public submissions, and particularly the expert public, uh, private expert public opinions, and they just were scathing. They were scathing. They said, are you joking? You really want to introduce this unknown genetics platform as a vaccine of all things? Well, first, it's not a vaccine because it's a genetically modified organism. And secondly, this has never been done before and it requires years of extensive safety profiling, not least of which, and you've said it a hundred times on your channel here, John, genotoxicity and carcinogenicity testing. Genotoxicity. What effects will these genetic materials have upon natural human DNA? That and we would have to have been done for a genetically modified organism license. It had to have been evaluated. And if there was an absence of that testing provided by the manufacturers when they provided that original dossier, like if they got the, if you're the OGTR and you receive the dossier from Pfizer and you're going through it and it's like, Pfizer, where's your genotoxicity test? You've got to show us that there's no impacts on human DNA here. And, and human cancers. That's right. And human cancers. And so if you're the OGTR, you'd hand the dossier back to Pfizer and say, uh, go and run those tests first because we can't do a proper risk assessment unless we see definitively that there is no risk of <clears throat> uh, genetic integration, disturbing natural genes, or potentially being onco oncogenic um, or, or creating tumors, cancers, as you just mentioned. These are all the fundamental tests that... Uh, uh, the gates that they've got to go through as part of a risk assessment and any public person providing submissions to that form of risk assessment would have picked that up in a flash if the OGTR dared to go to a public submission round in the absence of genotoxicity tests, for instance, and it would have been picked up by the public. And, it, and if, if the OGTR or the equivalent committee in the EMA tried to push through the approval in the absence of genotoxicity studies and carcinogenicity studies, the public would have picked up on it. So we would have had two issues. They tried to get these approvals through, they forced them through, and like they did, they got a lot of them approved towards the end of 2020 or early 2021. Had they gone through the GMO assessment path first as they were required to at law in this country and in the EU and in the US, and we can talk about the US a bit different later. There's no way that in Australia, for instance, there's no way a GMO license would have issued until much later, if at all, much later into 2021. Then they could have gone to the TJ and sought provisional approval, meaning that Pfizer, for instance, may not have uh, achieved ultimate approval for deploying physically their product until maybe 2022. And so by illegally cutting the GMO step out of the picture, they allowed them to advance quickly to the TGA and then get that much, much earlier approval without any of the public knowing. 
about the GMO aspect, let alone the ability to comment and say, are you joking? So this was all about cutting the public out of the information loop. So I guess they would say, <laughs> you're going to hear this one rolled out for sure, John. You'll get somebody in the TGA here and in Europe and also in the UK saying, oh, but we didn't want to create vaccine hesitancy. They're actually going to say that at some point, you know it. And then you've got to say, and sorry, respectfully, John, but you, if you get to hear a politician say that, you've got to say, shut up, mate, shut up, because they're not vaccines, but they're GMOs. And I'm allowed to have GMO hesitancy. I'm allowed to have GMO hesitancy when there's been no genotoxicity studies conducted, for instance, to inform me about whether or not this GMO is going to alter the natural DNA of my child and alter my ovaries or alter my sperm and thereafter for all of my prodigy and offspring alter their DNA if indeed they make it to life. Well, if I'd known that, I wouldn't have had hesitancy or I'd have had abject terror and uh, rejection, as I suspect the entire world's population would have done. It's just, um, yeah, we understand it's why disgust. people are angry. 